Okay, so let us answer some of the exercises on limits and continuity. So first, let's have limit of 1 minus 3x all over square root of 4x squared minus 3 minus 3x. So we want to divide both numerator and denominator by square root of x squared, which is the same as the absolute value of x. And notice that since we want x to approach negative infinity, it means that the absolute value of x is equal to negative x there. So I have my absolute value of x. All over my square root of 4x squared minus 3 minus 3x all over still the absolute value of x but here I will write it as square root of x squared. And we can now write this as the limit of 1. This one, I will write this as negative x. So this is negative 1 over x plus 3 all over. I will put the square root of x squared inside. So that's 4x squared minus 3 all over x squared minus 3 over my 3x over square root of x squared here is 3x over negative x. So that's minus negative 3. So that will be plus 3. And then I have my limit as x approaches negative infinity. And since the limit this limit here and this limit here, 3 over x squared, the limit is equal to 0 as x approaches infinity. We are only left with 3 over, I have 2 plus 3. So the answer is 3 fifths. So for our next problem, we want to evaluate this. Take note that I have a tangent there. But what I want to make use here is the fact that limit of sine star over star as star approaches 0 is equal to 1. So in order for me to have that, I will first write tangent as sine over cosine. So I have limit of sine of x squared minus x minus 2 over cosine x squared minus x minus 2. And then I will factor x squared minus x minus 2 as x minus 2. I know that it has a factor of x minus 2 so that I can make use of, of this fact over here. Let me just rewrite it as limit of sine. I have x minus 2, x plus 1 all over cosine x minus 2 x plus 1, and then I still have my x minus 2 here, and then my cosh of x minus 2. Now, 
Here, I have sine of x minus 2x plus 1. I only have an x minus 2 here, so therefore I need an extra x plus 1. So I will multiply x plus 1 on both numerator and denominator to make sure that I'm not changing the original expression. So therefore, I still have my x approaches 2 here. So this highlighted part here the limit of sine x minus 2 times x plus 1 all over x minus 2 x plus 1 as x approaches 2 is equal to 1. So I'm left with limit of x plus 1 over cosine x minus 2 x plus 1 cosh of x minus 2 as x approaches 2. So that is equal to 1 times 3 over cosine of 0 cosh of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. And then we've seen also in our last discussion that cosh of 0 is equal to 1. So therefore, the answer is equal to 3. Next, we want to evaluate sine of y squared all over y times 2 raised to 1 over y. So just like in the previous example, we will make use of this. So this limit can be written as sine of, let me factor this as y minus 1 times y all over y, 2 times 1 over y. For me to be able to make use of this, I need to introduce an extra factor of y minus 1. So I will multiply both numerator and denominator by y minus 1. I still have my y approaches 0. And notice now that if my star is y minus 1, so what's happening here is star is y minus 1, y, then if y approaches 0, it means that star is approaching 0 as well. So therefore, we can make use of this one. So I can now split it as limit of sine y minus y over up. Uh, times y all over y, y minus 1 times the limit of the rest of the factors. I have 1 minus 1, 2 raised to 1 over y. y approaches 0 from the right. Okay. And then this thing is equal to 1. Sorry, this is not equal to 0. This is equal to 1. And then for this one, what it, for this, I want to get the limit of 2 raised to 1 over y as y approaches 0. So first, let us see 1 over y. What happens as y approaches 0 from the right? This one approaches positive infinity. Correct? So therefore, if I have 2 raised to 1 over y, and 1 over y is theta, so here theta is 1 over y, if I get the limit of 2 raised to 1 over y as y approaches 0, this is the same as the limit of 2 raised to theta as theta approaches positive infinity. And therefore, this thing is equal to positive infinity infinity. All right, we have just shown that the limit of 2 raised to 1 over y is equal to infinity, right? So therefore, the limit of the numerator y minus 1 as y approaches 0 from the right, this is negative 1, but the denominator approaches infinity. That is the form. So therefore, the whole thing, the limit of the numerator 
approaches a constant, but the limit of the denominator approaches infinity, that one is equal to, that limit is equal to zero. Again, this one here is negative one over infinity, just for the form. And therefore, the final answer here is equal to zero. Okay, next, let us have this one. Let us discuss the continuity of this function at x equals negative 1 and x equals 0. So first, let us evaluate the... Um, let us determine the continuity at x equals negative 1. So at x equals negative 1, we would have to make use of this function, the first function, and the second function because negative 1 is an endpoint. So we have to make use of this one when x approaches. We use this when x approaches negative 1 from the left and we make use of this when x approaches negative 1 from the right. So first, let me get the limit of x squared plus, wait, this is the limit of h of x. As x approaches negative 1 from the left, we will make use of x squared plus 2x over absolute value of x plus 2 as x approaches negative 1 from the left. Okay, so first we have to determine what is the absolute value of x plus 2. Is it x plus 2 or the negative of x plus 2? This is equal to x plus 2 when x plus 2 is greater than or equal to 0 and this is the negative of x plus 2 when x plus 2 is less than 0 or we can write it as x plus 2 when x is greater than or equal to negative 2, negative of x plus 2 when x is less than negative 2. However, we are looking at the values when x is coming from the left of negative 1. But according to the definition of the absolute value of x plus 2, here, on the left of negative 2, you use negative x plus 2. But on the right of negative 2, you use x plus 2. So therefore, I will make use of x plus 2. And then just by looking at Actually, even if you don't do that, you can actually um, substitute because hindi naman nahahati yung x plus 2 sa negative 1. You can actually, yes, sorry about that. You can just substitute. But anyway, since this is just negative 1. But anyway, just let's just suppose, I, let me just continue with it. Because that's our usual technique. I know whenever we have an absolute value, we always remove the absolute value sign. So let me just write it as x times x plus 2 over x plus 2. x approaches negative 1. So we just have negative 1. Or for the shortcut, for the shortcut there, we can easily substitute na lang. Kasi we don't get a 0 over 0 naman eh. So let, let's just verify, no? Check. This is, if we substitute, negative 1 squared plus 2 over absolute value of negative 1 plus 2. So I have um, negative 2 plus 1. So that's negative 1 over 1. So I really get negative 1. So anyway, for this part here, you 
for this part at x equals negative 1, you don't really need this. No need. Okay. But for x equals negative 2, you will definitely make use of that. Next, let's have limit. Limit of h of x as x. approaches negative 1 from the right. So we are making use of the greatest integer function of 2x plus 1 as x approaches negative 1 from the right. And what do we do here? We substitute a value which is very, very close to negative 1 from the right. So let's say 2 times negative 0 0.9 plus 1. So that's negative 1.8 plus 1. So that's negative 0 0.8, which is also equal to negative 1. So therefore, the limit of h of x as x approaches negative 1 is equal to negative 1 because the left hand and the right hand limits are the same. And what about the, the value of h of negative 1? If you look at the definition, what will we make use of? We use the first function because x equals negative 1 is included there. But that is actually... We already have it also. That is also negative 1. So therefore, h is continuous at x equals negative 1. I will no longer be doing the checking for x equals 0. I will leave that up to you. For our next problem, we have this graph. Based from the graph, evaluate limit of f of x as x approaches 2 from the left. So you're approaching 2 from the left. So you're going this way. So if you look at the graph, what is happening there? The y coordinates get closer and closer to 0, right? So therefore, the answer is equal to zero. Next, um, identify the type of discontinuity. So before we can get the type of discontinuity, well, actually, just by looking at this one, it's a, it's sort of jump in and in, um, infinite, right? So you can just say that this is an essential discontinuity. The point is that it is not removable because the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 from the left is 0, whereas the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 from the right is equal to negative infinity, right? Because as you approach 2 from the right, the graph is, you're going to trace this part of the graph and you can now see that it approaches negative infinity. Next, let's look at number 3. Evaluate the limit of f of x as x approaches positive infinity. So, as we go to the right, what happens to the graph? It will get closer and closer to the line y equals 3. And therefore, this limit is equal to 3. True or false, the line y equals 3 is a horizontal asymptote the answer is definitely yes since the limit the limit as x approaches infinity is equal to 3 remember that when you are looking at horizontal asymptote we want to know how the graph uh, behaves on its tail either on the right or on the left okay
Next, we want to show that this function has a root on 0, 3. Now, for the IVT, recall that usually what you would do is you will make use of h of 0, right? However, we cannot make use of h of 0 because this does not exist because log of 0 does not exist, right? Base 3. The graph of the logarithmic function, ganito siya. Okay, it will never hit um, x equals 0. But the point there, even if you do not know how this function looks like, um, you know that you will have, you will intersect the graph somewhere along 0 up to 3. So you don't know how it looks like. So what I will do is I will get a number which is at least greater than 0. Okay? So what do I mean by that? So in order to make use of the IVT, by the way, we have to check the hypothesis first. Okay. What I will do is I will limit it to the interval 1, 3. Because if I have a root on the interval 1, 3, then that interval is also on the interval. Uh, I mean, that number is also on the interval 0, 3. Okay. So first, my h is continuous on 1, 3. Correct? Because you have log here and square root of 3x, that is continuous. And what else? Let us compute h of 1. My h of 1 is 2 log 3, 1 third plus square root of 3, which is 2 log, this is 3 to the negative 1 plus square root of 3. I can write this as negative 2 log of 3, right? And the reason why I chose 1 is because log of 3 base 3 is now equal to 1. And therefore, take note that square root of 3 is approximately 1 point something. This negative 2 plus square root of 3 is definitely negative. Whereas h of My h of 3, what about my h of 3? That's 2 log 3 plus square root of 3 times 3, which is equal to 2 plus 3, which is 5, and that is greater than 0. So we have shown that h of 1 is negative. So even if you don't know how the graph looks like, this is 1, 3. h of 1 is negative, h of 3 is positive. So therefore... By IVT, there exists a C element of 1, 3, and this 1, 3 is also inside 0, 3, such that here, these are your possible Cs. Your H of C will now be equal to 0. Next, let us use the squeeze theorem to evaluate this expression. So again, we make use of the fact that sine x and cosine x are between negative 1 and 1. And therefore, sine x plus cosine x is between negative 2 and 2. And I can now multiply both sides by e to the x. And take note that the inequality did not change because e to the x is always positive, right? The graph of y equals e to the x is like that. So e to the x is always positive. However, when I divide both sides by x, take note here that x is negative because x approaches negative infinity. So the inequality sign will now change. Sine x plus cosine x over 
x, it will now become like that. But either way, the inequality sign actually does not matter because the limit of 2e to the x, let's evaluate the limit of 2e to the x as x approaches um, negative infinity. Okay, this is the graph of y equals e to the x. So as x approaches negative infinity, this approaches 2 over 0. And then x, um, this one approaches negative infinity. Now, if you have, what is that? 0 divided by infinity. Is that an indeterminate? Actually, if you have this form, you can just view this. This one will still be equal to 0. Why is that? Because remember that if your denominator approaches a very negative number, a very large negative number, even if this one will not, this the numerator will only approach 0. But the point is the numerator is always a constant. The numerator is always a constant over something where, wherein the denominator becomes very, very negative. So the whole thing will still approach zero. So similarly, the limit of negative 2e to the x over x as x approaches negative infinity is equal to zero. So therefore, the limit that we want, the limit of e to the x sine x plus cosine x all over x as x approaches negative infinity is equal to zero. We can actually use the Desmos to verify if we really have if the limit is really equal to zero. So this is the graph of y equals e to the x, sine x plus cosine x over x. So notice here on the left-hand side, if you zoom out, see, it has multiple intercepts here, but this one, it's actually sort of fluctuating, but the point is that, um, it will still approach zero as x approaches negative infinity. Okay, here I have the graph of y equals e to the x sine x plus cosine x over x. And notice that if you um, zoom out, it seems as if the graph here is just the a negative x-axis, but actually the graph is fluctuating there. So there you go. It's actually sort of fluctuating sort of thing. But if you, there, and it, the, the limit is really equal to zero as x approaches negative infinity. Next, let's have this one, limit of tangent inverse of cosh inverse of x. Let us start by making this theta. We'll first find the limit of the innermost function, cosh inverse x, as x approaches theta. So we want to know where does theta approach as x approaches positive infinity. So this is the graph of y equals cosh inverse x. So as we go to the right, as x becomes bigger and bigger, the y coordinates will become bigger and bigger. So this is positive infinity. So we can now replace this limit by limit of tangent inverse of theta, but theta will now approach positive infinity. This is the graph of y equals tangent inverse x 
as x approaches, uh, this one you can make just this one theta. As you go to the right, the y coordinate will become closer and closer to pi over 2. Negative.